How can you tell if a book is great and how can you measure its greatness? This is a question that I get in varying degrees from time to time. So today I want to give you 10 ways you can measure your books, 10 ways you can figure out if the book before you is great or not. Uh, first things first, you have to come to terms with this idea of measuring. There's this Greek idea of Aegon, the Olympic Games, where people would compete or athletes would compete for top prizes. There could unfortunately only be one winner in each game and this is the same in anything that you want to do where you want to find out if something's great or not it is always by virtue of comparing it with something else I suppose that's a shame uh, the same sort of people who don't like the philosophy running through Atlas Shrugged are perhaps the sort of people who think that all works of literature should be made uh, should be treated equally or uh, things like identity should be the dictator for whether we give something credence or whether we read something or not unfortunately if you're talking about aesthetic merit there are even though it's a very subjective um, art it's a very subjective pleasure and hobby there are objective markers or at the very least you can measure it up against your subjective enjoyment you will enjoy some books more than others you will find some books more thought-provoking than others indeed this might change depending on where you find yourself in your life what does the landscape of your life look like right now what are you going through somebody who's becoming a parent for the first time and somebody who's graduating from university someone who's just been fired somebody who's going through a breakup or somebody who's fallen in love these are people who are all in different stations of their life so, so if you can't appreciate for example Proust right now well it might take you it might take you a while. You might be 50, 60, 70, 80, even 90 before you appreciate Proust. If you feel like the boat, you've missed the boat for crime and punishment, well, that might just be something that the, the moral conundrum that runs through Dostoevsky's early mature masterpiece might be something that would only really fully speak to you during your younger years. So, regardless, you have to measure it up against everything. So whenever you finish a book, or whenever you're in the process of reading a book, ask yourself, who is this better than? Who is it worse than? And you can even divide it into quadrants and different degrees. Who, who does characterization better? Now, how you want to define better is up to you. Uh, compelling characterization, is it to do with um, psychological complexity? If so, Tolstoy and Shakespeare would be high up there. Um, if it's to do with allegory, then maybe Dostoevsky would be up there. But if you think it's better to be psychologically compelling and faithful to the truth, or what looks like faithful representation of reality, then you might say, hey, Austin is better at character than Dostoevsky. But then you might want to talk about pacing, a uh, theme, you could get into it, language construction. Um, so always compare and measure. Whenever you clock a book, you're asking yourself who they're better than, and of course why, and who you enjoy more. You need to, that's the sad fact of reality, is that there is a competition going on, and you can only measure what's great by knowing who's the greatest, and then comparing them all to them. Now the second way you can measure if a book is great, or at least a, if a book is great for you, is its re-readability. And what does re-readability look like? I think it means frequency and depth. So you can re-read a book and flick through it, read your favourite bits, you can re-read a book after many years of its absence, or you can re-read it so frequently that it's always on your bedside, or it's always on your desk, or you're always taking it down from the shelf, that it's falling apart. You can re-read it in great depth, you can pick chapters out and reread it three times in one sitting so the degree to which you want to reread and relive the book and always get stuff out of it that's another uh, another part another part of measuring with a, if a book is great or not how much can you derive from it um, does it make your human experience more robust what can Shakespeare and Austin say to you about the nature of love justice uh, what can Tolstoy say about war peace uh, this is all about how much it fulfills you as a human being walking around in the world talking to yourself and talking to other people and another way to measure how great a book is is what happens if you live it indeed can you live it and what does live it mean that means if a book throws up questions they preoccupy you when you're not reading the book you talk about the book with other people you tie it in with other things that you're experiencing other art other media this is called synoptic reading that's where everything that you consume is now bound up with this one book that you're reading how many tendrils does it have how sticky are they how far are their reach that's another way to measure if the book you're reading is indeed great or not now another way to measure a greatness of literature is inevitability of remembrance. That means how inevitable is it that you will remember something? 
a word, a phrase, a character, a scene with poetry. If you can remember a couple of lines without much effort, of course, with poetry, you have to reread and reread, but without much effort, you can sort of things are sticky and they stay in your mind. Uh, it's the same with scenes. If you read Anna Karenina, and there are certain scenes that stay stuck in your mind and you can visualize them very strongly. Um, that's inevitability of remembrance. That means that the author has succeeded in rendering a work that is like life itself, that's like nature that comes up from the ground. You don't question it. So, is it inevitable? That's another way you can measure if a book is great or not. Now, another way, we can talk about characters. Do you find the characters compelling? Are they people rather than characters? Do you treat them almost like corporeal envelopes in which you respond to them? That's a Proustian idea. With your own thought, your own history. Um, our social personalities, says Proust, are a creation of the thoughts of other people. Can you meet the people of the world and are they like real people? Do you, like when, when old people talk about old Russians, when they talk about Anna Karenina, uh, they talk about Levin and Kitty and Dolly and Anna, Steva, Vronsky, they talk about them as though they're old friends. Um, of course, some characters are allegory, some are metaphorical, um, but are they rememberable first and foremost? How much do you, how easily do you remember them? That's another key to measure in your books. Another way to measure is just how effective the writer is in the miniature and the macro. That means, can you read a section of your book, and I'm gonna use Proust and Tolstoy as an example again, can you slice out a paragraph and read it almost like its own standalone thing? With Proust and Tolstoy, you most certainly can. With Shakespeare, you most certainly can. Even with Austin, you most certainly can. But not only can you appreciate them on the mi micro, like the beautiful sentences, the, you know, the inevitability of phrasing, the poeticism, but it also ties into the macro. How does the micro tie effortlessly, seemingly effortlessly, because these writers, they really suffer and labor hard to make it seem effort, effortless. How much does that tie into the macro? So can you talk about the, the wide sweep of the universe of the work? And can you also deep dive and appreciate just a small facet, a little gem from the world? Another marker of how great a book is, is how much can you talk about it? Not how much do you talk about it, because many people talk about things over and over again and they repeat themselves and they never get a new point. I mean, how much can you talk about it in varied and new ways? How much discussion is ripe for mining in the book club. Every single uh, book that's been on the schedule, that's the Hardcore Literature Book Club at patreon.com forward slash hardcore literature, is open to endless discussion. So when we have a book on the list, the discussion never dies. The conversation keeps going because it can. Um, so Anna Karenina, Crime and Punishment, Siddhartha Don Quixote, which are coming up very soon, uh, Persuasion, which we've just wrapped up, but the conversation's still going, Proust, is the conversation essentially endless? If so, you might just have a great book on your hands. Now, another way you can measure is, does it elicit a strong visceral reaction? What are the themes and preoccupations of the world and how do they speak to you? It can be any sort of reaction. You don't have to be comfortable. There's this uh, modern day fetish of people needing everything to be easy and smooth and pleasurable. Um, Crime and Punishment by Dostoevsky is not comfortable. It's claustrophobic, it's cloying, it's a dirty world. The St. Petersburg of Dostoevsky. Um, but it is very, it's very compelling and it's very impelling and instructive and we can learn. It provides a real vicarious experience that's like life itself uh, that will elicit a strong emotion um, from almost anybody who reads it. Um, different books elicit strong emotions. They don't have to be pleasurable, although you might want some of your books to, to make you smile, make you laugh. Don Quixote is good for that, although Don Quixote will also make you cry. Um, but that's another way to measure your books is that how far, how, how varied is the range and the gamut of human experience. Some prize winners are very, very bland and they don't, they don't give you lots and lots of slices. Uh, a whole tapestry, a whole rainbow of different human colors. They just don't do that, unfortunately. It actually shocks me why they win prizes. Maybe it's just politics first and foremost. Who knows? And finally, if you can answer why, if you can answer that question, why read X? You've got the book before you, why? If you can answer that really with a very strong, passionate answer, you also have a book on your hands. He who has a why to live for, said Nietzsche, and then later Viktor Frankl in the Nazi death camps, can bear almost any how, and this applies to books too. Give it a strong why, or let it give you a strong why, and you have a great book on your hands. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Do you agree with any of my points? Disagree? Do you have any more to add? Let me know in the comments below. And if you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and subscribe. Thank you for watching and happy reading.